Hello, everybody. Welcome to Early Access PyCharm. I'm your host, Nafiel Islam. PyCharm's debugger has to be one of its most powerful tools, and it is so powerful that I don't even know how to use all of its features. From being able to just debug anywhere, including but not limited to Jupyter Notebooks and Django template files or Flask template files or whatever template files that you want to debug, it's got a lot of features and it has an interesting history. So how did all of this start? I think I can answer this question. This is Elizaveta Shashkova, also known as Lisa. She's one of the members of the PyCharm debugging team. I think uh, a lot of people know that uh, PyCharm is built on top on IntelliJ platform. So originally uh, our debugger didn't exist, but we had a debugger for Java. And then later support for appeared as a Python plugin. And um, people asked us for as well. And uh, we, uh, well, th not we, but <laughs> developers who worked on Python plugin uh, that time, uh, decided to do a fork of PyDev. A Python plugin for Eclipse. And after that, we started to develop uh, them as uh, separate parts. Uh, uh, so yeah. I and to, uh, for, for those who don't know, what exactly is Eclipse? I mean, some might have forgotten <laughs> there used to be other IDEs other than JetBrains. Yeah, <laughs> long time ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, Eclipse is also an IDE for Java and other programming languages. And yeah, there is a PyDev is plugin. Uh, support for Python language inside Eclipse. So originally awesome. we made a fork from PyDev, yeah, and started to, to develop it independently and synchronized our changes from time to time. This is how PyCharm debugger started. <laughs> so I'm guessing that Java being a statically typed language had a lot of artifacts and a lot of features that, that you wanted to import into the PyCharm world. How did you decide what to keep and what to leave out? So. Hi, everyone. And this is Andre Leasing. There are a lot of Andres on the PyCharm team, but this Andre is especially nice, and he's also the other member of the PyCharm debugging team. As you mentioned, IntelliJ IDEA has influenced us in a few obvious ways. Yeah, like the UI of the debugger that we use in PyCharm greatly resembles IntelliJ IDEA debugger. So we use the same UI elements. We don't want it to be that different and pretty much be similar between our IDs. I'd say Java debugger uh, in IntelliJ is exceptional, and I hardly can imagine how one could delve into a huge Java project without uh, a good debugging support. Things are different between Java and Python, since in Java, you already have a lot of information about your code because of Java's statically typed language which is uh, not the case for Python. And uh, some parts of Java debugger have more sense in Java world than in Python world. For example, uh, expression evaluation in Java. So when you hit a breakpoint in Java, it's uh, a really good thing that you can run some, ex some Java expression to see the result which is not necessarily the best way to do it for Python, since Python, the, the dynamic nature of Python gives you this opportunity to run a Python console, which is supported in PyCharm, and you can Im immediately run your code and see the results. So not necessary. you want to do this uh, using the debugger. For example, I don't really use the evaluate expression calculator box. I mostly go into the debug console and I just start typing stuff out and I get code completion, which is great. So going back to Python, Dev, what did we actually take from PyDev? And what did we give back to PyDev? Because it's not just about taking stuff from open source, it's also about giving back. In fact, Python debugger consists of two parts. Uh, the first part is, uh, well, IDE part, user interface. And the second part is Python backend, where, well, uh, debugger works with Python process and trace some events in your program and do some the main logic of the debugger. And actually, we uh, got from PyDev this uh, backend part and some parts of uh, well, <laughs> the the some parts of uh, logic of the connection which debugger establishes between your interface and Python backend. But yeah, user interface was fully our interface from IntelliJ platform. And it's true that when we did a fork, we decided, of course, we did a lot of bug fix and added some new features. And the author of PyDev also did some fi fixes and some 
bug fix. And of course, yeah, we wanted, um, it was great. We was working in fact on the same project and we decided to synchronize our changes. So we will send him our changes and we'll get some bug fixes from him. And that was a great uh, type of work because we worked together on the same thing and we got benefits both from our work and from uh, PyDev authors work. I mean, it's a win-win situation. I just wanted to add that uh, I think one of the most significant part of, of the code that was backported from PyCharm to PyDev was this frame evaluation functionality that uh, Lisa was responsible for originally. And uh, th this thing that makes debugging faster, really faster in some cases. And I think this is uh, a good example of code flow in back and forth between PyDev and uh, PyCharm. Absolutely, absolutely. So going back to debugging and adding support for different things, like PyCharm works with Docker, works with remote interpreters. So on the basis of remote interpreters, how did you actually make that work, number one? And number two, did you build it in a way that you could support multiple remote types, I guess? So from WSL to SSH to Docker to all these other uh, kinds of, I guess, targets. The reason I ask is because I'm guessing having to build custom debug support for every little remote thing is hard. So how did you folks work to make that extensible? From the technical point of view, there is no much difference between your local machine and a remote machine, since all interaction between the debugger and ID happens through sockets. So it doesn't really matter if you run your code on your local machine or in, in the cloud. If we can deliver the debugger's code to a remote machine, we'll be fine. You know, this uh, funny PyCharm helpers folder in your home directory. But things uh, become more interesting, for example, for Docker, since it does not allow you to open as many ports as you probably want for all types of interactions between the ID and debugger. And that's why uh, you have to install some extra uh, Python packages. So you said they, they communicate over sockets. What are we talking about here? Are we talking about Unix sockets or web sockets? How do they exactly work? We're talking about uh, TCP sockets in this case. Ah, so in yeah. this case, it's essentially working over a network, even when you're on your local machine. Uh, exactly, yeah. So this is pretty common for language runtimes. For example, in Java, as far as I'm concerned, it happens uh, the same way. Mm. So you're, you just open a socket and uh, send uh, information back and forth. So for sure, we have our own debugging protocol to make this interaction possible to send information uh, from debugger to the ID and uh, requests from uh, the ID back to debugger. So that's how it happens. So essentially, it's just one big web service. That's what you're telling me. Not exactly web service. Yeah. <laughs> it's an application that has a few open ports. Yeah. A, a few so open sockets through which so, all communication happens. So potentially, if somebody in the future creates a web version of PyCharm, could you do debugging via WebSocket? I think so. Uh, nothing prevents you from writing some extra layer of abstraction and uh, make uh, interaction possible using some other protocol. And I think it's um, already done for our uh, Python console because I think Lisa can uh, tell us more about this because she was responsible for that part. Yeah, our Python console, you, you might know this interactive REPL, uh, works very similar. So again, there is a user interface and there is a Python backend which executes your actual code. And again, these parts are connect, uh, establish connection and send some mutual comments. And we used to use this previous custom API, uh, but later we moved to Thrift protocol. It's a binary protocol and just establish uh, uh, one connection. So you can use it, for example, in Docker, in some containers, and uh, you can connect to your Python backend without any problems in these cases. And actually, we have a plan to do the same for our Python debugger, so to reuse Thrift protocol, so it works a bit faster, and it also makes uh, connection establishment a bit easier. 
for us. One of the things that always fascinated me about PyCharm is the async support for debugging that we have, or the support for async debugging, should I say. How did that come about, and how was that different from developing debugging support for synchronous code? From the debugger point of view, there is not uh, asynchronous code is not that different from synchronous code. Debugging multi-threaded code is a much harder problem here because when you work with asynchronous code, it happens in the same thread and asynchronous code execution is not that different. Because it's still the, in the, one thread? Yeah. The only difference is that you have this event loop and callbacks can fire in pretty much random order and so on. When you hit a breakpoint, inside an asynchronous function. It's the same situation as for uh, synchronous code. What, what really differs here is uh, the way you want to uh, represent this information inside your IDE. For example, when you stop inside an asynchronous function, you can see a lot of async IO or whatever asynchronous framework you use machinery in the stack trace, which is not necessarily what you want to see, because probably you want to focus on the code that has something to do with your project and not all this machinery that makes it possible to run asynchronous functions. Okay, so essentially what you're telling me is the main challenge here was visualizing where you are in your code for the user. Um, visualizing, and... make it possible to filter out some uh, stuff that uh, probably not that necessary. There are definitely a lot of things to do in terms of synchronous support. For example, it would be nice to have uh, an option to evaluate some synchronous function in a synchronous manner when you hit a breakpoint, you know, just to get the result immediately. Indeed, it would be. The thing is, uh, synchronous programming is uh, not that different from synchronous programming, but with complicated flow. That's why I'm amazed that we have a debugger for it. I mean, I don't even understand the code itself. How on earth did you guys make a debugger for it? <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, talking about stuff to do and uh, what needs to be done, there's a new PEP out there for pattern matching that is going to be implemented. I was telling Lisa that we should probably put this only in PyCharm Pro, but uh, she said, no way. This will also be in PyCharm Community. <laughs> so, so tell me, how does this present new challenges for, for the debugging team? It's a very famous feature, pattern matching, which was added in the latest you might even Python say infamous. release. Yeah, one day we had an internal talk inside our PyCharm team where our team lead, Andrei Vlasaskiv, described us this app uh, showing examples and showed a lot of t tricky examples or some, I don't know, abusive examples, <laughs> how you can um, use this feature the wrong way. And yeah, I realized that most likely if this feature is not that easy to understand, so it's not so easy to understand for me, most likely there will be a lot of other Python developers who will need at least some support <laughs> for understanding this feature, at least in the very beginning. And Debugger is a great tool not only for searching for bugs, but also for understanding the code. And I think here we can also uh, can use our power of runtime because, uh, well, when you're working with static analysis, you usually uh, don't know everything about your code you're running. But at runtime, you know everything about every object you have in your local scope. And I think here, debugger can help uh, developers to understand what's going on in their pattern and uh, how they can use it or what went wrong, why this pattern or why does this match doesn't work correctly uh, and i think yeah pycharm can be very helpful here Andrei? about the runtime yeah i just wanted to add that though these new python features may seem to be like a huge change and they are for the language uh, itself if we are lucky enough there is nothing to do on the debugger side because the debugger leverages a lot of functionality from the runtime itself. And if Python interpreter is able to report the information about uh, code execution correctly, for example, uh, on which line we are uh, stopped and uh, in which file, if this information can be obtained from the Python interpreter and we can uh, trust it, 
there's nothing to worry about. I remember that talk that Andrei Vlasovsky gave, and everybody was really quiet when he asked, so do you understand how pattern matching works? And it was the funniest thing I had ever seen because I had never seen so many of the PyCharm developers completely stumped as to how it works. I mean, they all understood how to use it. It's just that There are so many ways in which it can be abused that it was kind of scary. So on that ominous note, thank you both for coming. And thank you so much for explaining to us how the debugger in PyCharm got started and also what the challenges will be going into the future. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. (laughs) And thank you for listening. If you liked what you've heard, please let us know in the comments on YouTube. You can always subscribe to us via Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get your podcast. Again, thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you again next time.